So this is Tamura paper number one from 2022. Now there are lots of people who first ever watched or discovered my channel through preparation for this test here. And uh, it happened in October or November, I can't remember which. And after it happened, a lot of people wrote comments or emailed me directly and were like, man, that paper one was absolutely disgusting. It was so much harder than any other paper one. Paper two was fine, but paper one, man, totally different to any other paper one. Absolutely gross. What a terrible paper. And it's been like eight or nine or 10 months since then. And I couldn't see the paper. Just, I could never have a look at it. I, I never knew what they were talking about. I wondered like, oh, was, like, did I not teach it very well? Like, was the preparation not good enough? What went wrong? Um, why did they find this so hard? These are the scaled scores, by the way. So um, paper one, it does seem or look like was, was found much harder by candidates than paper two. You can see that because the scores are higher for fewer marks. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a long nine or ten months where I've been waiting for this paper to have a good look at it and to be able to do it and to to see what these people were talking about. So yeah, let's let's do it then. And, and, and it has been really fun to do. And uh, it's, yeah, so let's just do it. Number one, uh, we have uh, just a nice easy warm up question at least here. We're just going to factorize this to make this. We're going to solve this part for zero and this part for zero. Start over here. Add one of the square roots. Remember the plus minus, of course. How many times? Because we're just we're not looking for solutions. Just how many of them there are. How many times does cos theta equal a minus one or plus one between zero and two pi inclusive, which is important because that means it's one, two, and three. So that's three solutions there. Here, add the three divided by two. This number is bigger than one. So when you square root it, it's still bigger than one. And cos can't be something that's bigger than one. So there's no solutions there. And the answer is three. So a nice easy warm-up question and we'll get to number two. We just need to complete the square to get this in like regular circle form. So halve this number, take away the square of it here. Halve this number, take away the square of it here collect all this stuff together. And the only condition you need on this is such that this number here is bigger than zero um, because that's this represents R squared, which has to be bigger than zero. Um, so therefore we just need this bigger than, uh, than zero. Um, yes, yeah, so, so this here, you can divide by two, you can factorize out the P. And of course this is a quadratic inequality. Uh, critical values at zero and four. So bigger than zero means either side of each one. So we need to be less than zero or greater than four, which is this one here. Yeah, another nice one there. Question number three. Obvious thing to do to start with, I think, would be to take this and integrate it to get f dash equals ax plus b, using b as the constant of integration, and then just integrate again to get a over 2x squared plus bx plus c. And now this just means the y intercept, right? f of zero is one. So that means the y intercept is one, which means c is one. So that's good. Plug that in there. And now this one means f of one is two. So this becomes two when these are ones. So let's do that. Double it and, and rearrange and get this. And now this one, we're just going to integrate this thing here and uh, evaluate between 0 and 1. And we're going to set that to be 1. And we should get some final information that we need. This is easy to integrate, right? Because the zeros just do nothing and the 1s just make everything go away. So that's good. We get this. And uh, and yeah, we can uh, cancel the 1s times over by 6. Do this one, take away this one to get b is minus 2. And then shove that into there and you get a is 6. And that will be our answer. So excellent. Three nice questions here. Question number four, I did using radians. So arc length is r theta and area r squared theta over two. I'm actually, I actually can't remember whether that's expected in Tamir, um, but I did it anyway. And I think most people know what I'm talking about. Uh, these are similar. So therefore theta equals theta here. Um, and so arc, arc length is r theta. So of course, six is r theta from here and area is r squared theta over two. Now reading this here, the difference between this area and this area is that we could say r plus three all squared times theta over two is minus r squared theta over two is 21. So we can sell it up. We can factorize out the theta over two. The r squares, when you expand this, will cancel to leave you with six r plus nine. You can times by two. Um, theta is uh, six over r. You can times by r, you can divide by six to get this. And then obviously r is just nine, which isn't the answer because it wants you to find the difference between the perimeters. So this perimeter is nine, nine, six, which makes 24. And this perimeter is 12, 12. And then this arc length here is r theta, so that's 12 theta. And we just need to adjust this a little bit. And um, we know that nine theta, because r is nine, isn't it? We know that nine theta is six. So if we divide it by three, we get three theta is two, which means 12 theta, which is this radius here, 12 theta will be eight. And then we just do 12 plus 12 plus eight, uh, which is 32. Difference between the perimeters is eight, and the answer is C. Question number five then is as free as Americans on the 4th of July. You just set x1 in here and x2 there. So five equals three plus p over three plus q like this. You times by three plus q. You do a bit of rearranging and I'll put that over there. You then set 
uh, x2s in here and x3 over here to get 7 is 5 plus p over 5 plus q. You uh, multiply this over here, you do a bit of rearranging and you end up with this. You can then do this one minus this one or this one minus this one, it doesn't really matter. Divide by 2, you get this. Shove that value back in here, you get this. And find the value of x4, you literally just need to say x4 is x3, which is 7 plus p, which you know, divided by 7 plus q, which you know. And be careful with your minuses, but eventually you'll end up with the answer of 13. Good. Question number six is gorgeous. You just integrate x for x squared over 2. You plug in these two values here. Now, the thing to know here, of course, is that you can't really do anything with logs that are multiplying. So in other words, squaring is multiplying, right? So you can't really do too much with this. You can obviously factorize that with a half. And now what you do with this, it's a difference of two squares, right? It's this one squared minus this one squared. So it's this plus this times this minus this. And now we've got some logs adding and subtracting, which means we can follow log laws. 5 times 20 is 100. Uh, 20 divided by 5 is 4. Log to base 2 of 4 is 2, which cancels with the half. And you just end up with m is 100. Uh, and it's just a lovely question. Question number 7 then. If you watched my video that I helped you with on mods just before the exam, you should have got this question right 100% of the time. Because the way that I told you to do stuff like this just works exactly right. You say over here, x is bigger than 0. And when x is bigger than 0, this mod does absolutely nothing. So this is the graph. You factorize that. You say it's got a y-intercept of minus 12. And a, this root doesn't matter at minus 2 because we're only drawing the graph over here. So a root at 6 here. And it's just a quadratic that's going to look like this, right? Um, except, again, we're only drawing it over here. So let's ignore the picture over here and think about what happens over here. Well, over here, x is less than 0. And what the mod does when it, the input is less than 0 is it times it by minus 1. So this becomes x squared plus 4x minus 12, which you factorize. This solution doesn't uh, is the only one that matters at minus 6. This one doesn't because it's a positive 2, where I'm not intending to draw this graph at all. And this just looks symmetrical, right? It just does the same thing like this with the solution at 2 here, which we don't care about. Except this is symmetrical now. So the area between the y-axis and the graph is just double the area um, in this little section here, which is just the integral between 0 and 6 of this thing here. So this is just the entire question. You then, of course, integrate, you put the numbers in, and uh, you end up with, of course, minus 144 because it's underneath the axis, so just make it positive there. And we have that one done as well. Question 8 looks very intimidating, but you just need to remember the formula, which is this uh, for the sum of the first n sequences in a geometric series. You can plug just n is 30 into all of these to get this. And now what's nice about this is that the a's all cancel, just divide everything here by a. A isn't zero because they're positive integers. So divide everything by A and also times everything by one minus R. So in other words, all of this just goes away and you get left with this. Of course, one minus one is nothing. Minus minus makes a plus. So we end up with this. Um, and can you see the trick here? Yeah, factorize out R to the 20. And then this cancels because this still isn't zero because R is a positive integer that's not one. And you end up with this. To make K as small as possible, if r is a positive integer, you just make r2, and you have the value of k is that, and that will be done. Question 9 then, so a couple of ways you could do this. I'm going to rearrange this for g of x, uh, like this, and then I'm just going to plug it into here, and then expand out. And uh, now I can, it, it looks a bit weird, but I can complete the square on this. Um, I can say, because I've got something of a form like f squared minus 2 sine x f, I can halve the 2 sine x and put it in a bracket like this, and then take away sine squared of x here. So I've just completed the square using this entire function here. Kind of interesting. Anyway, you can add sine squared to both sides. Of course, that turns out quite well. You can square roots to give you a plus or a minus one, of course, and then you can add sine of x. And like, how do we make f, f absolutely minimum for all solutions? Well, you want to choose a minus one here, and then you want to set sine of x to also be minus one, because that's the smallest it gets. And then minus one, minus one is minus two, and we'll have our answer. Um, and, uh, and that would be good. You can actually do that question by brute force, right? You can do that question by brute force. You can uh, say cos squared is just 1 minus sine squared. You can then do difference of two squares here to make 1 minus sine, 1 plus sine. And then you can assign f of x to be this one and g of x to be that one. Because then if you notice, when you do f of x minus g of x, 1 minus 1 goes away. Sine minus minus sine is 2 sine x. So therefore, we have f of x is this. Except that gives you a minimum value of 0, because when sine of x is minus 1, you just get 0. So then you have to be uh, really, really bad 
and notice that actually if you did minus this times minus this, you'd also get this. Um, and then if you assign f of x to be this one and g of x to be this one, um, then you still get them taking away to make this. And then this has a minimal value of minus two. And we can do it that way as well. Anyway, number 10. So when you do graph transformations that are just translations, translations only, so moving left, right, moving up, down, that's the x minus a and the just the plus something on the end. So we could we could move it like right first. And, uh, and it looks a bit like this. And then we could move it up or down. But then notice, if you move it up or down again, like if you add a C here, that could just group with the B to make a plus D, and you haven't changed anything. And if you move it left or right again, again, this will just group with this to make a new number, and you haven't done anything else. So no matter how many different translations you do, you're still going to end up with something of the form this. You can just group together all the numbers that you use and just end up with these two. So when we do a bunch of translations, the answer must be in this form. Now, if I just expand this out using a bit of binomial, I can then compare the coefficients that I've got here to the coefficients here and see which one of them are possible. Now, this clearly isn't. There's, there's no way to put a 27 here, just moving left, right, up and down. So that immediately goes. Now, when I look at this one, I can see, well, actually, if you make a 3, this makes a minus 9 and this makes a plus 27. Uh, and then I can just make b whatever I need to make b to make this work. So I think this is completely possible. Here, if I wanted a minus 3 here, I'd need a to be 1, but a1 doesn't give you this, so that doesn't seem possible either, and it's just 2. Good, question number 3 is great. Uh, log laws say that this moves down here. You then need to spot this is a constant, so it can just come outside the sum. It's got nothing to do with the ends, so we just move it. You can break this sum up into the sum of 1 minus the sum of n, and the sum of n is just n times n plus 1 over 2, or if you told Gaussian story, the Gaussian story, enough time to kids, you just know that this answer is 5050, and it's just 100 minus 5050. But anyway, otherwise n times n plus 1 over 2, and you end up with this answer here, of course, and we'll be done with this question super quickly. Question 12. So, kind of an interesting question. This is already in completed the square form. So this minimum value, where this graph is at a minimum, is k over 2, comma, all of this stuff, right? That's where this graph is at a minimum. Now, we're going to graph a bunch of these with different values of k, and we're going to select the one with the lowest y-coordinate of all of them. Now, the y-coordinate is this one here. So we want this coordinate here to be as small as possible for some value k. So let's just call that f of k, and let's differentiate, and that's set to 0. And we'll get k is minus 4 in order to make this as small as possible. It's just a quadratic, right? I could have completed the square or anything like that, but I just decided to differentiate because we completed the square on the previous question. So k is minus 4 gets you the smallest thing possible, but this thing itself is just a, b. So a plus b is just this plus this, which makes this. And then you can just put k is minus 4 into here, and you end up with a plus b is minus 7, and we'll have our answer. Good. Question 13. Um, expand these brackets out, and uh, the 2s cancel, which is really nice of them. Um, and then I've done a bunch of stuff here. I've cancelled the 2s, I've times everything by a cubed b cubed to get rid of this, to turn this into an a6b6, and to turn this into a root 2 a cubed b cubed, which I then move to the other side as well. So I've done a bunch of stuff here. Um, so um, just, yeah, cool. Um, I'm gonna, now going to think times by minus 1. No, I made the substitution first. y equals a cubed b cubed, which of course means y squared is a6b6, and then I times by minus 1. And now my aim here was just to solve this equation. So I think I completed the square just for the hell of it. So half this number, take away the square of this, which is 2 over 4, which is a half. Um, combine that together with that, and you get 9 over 2. Square root to get plus or minus 3 over root 2. And then add this, sorry, take this away from both sides. Now, we're looking for the least value of AB. So I'm going to choose the negative solution here, because that will get a smaller value of Y, which is where I'm going to get my AB, AB from. So anyway, choose the smallest one. You can also rationalize this by times y root 2 over root 2. Then take this away from both sides. Minus 3 root 2 over 2 minus another root 2 over 2 is minus 4 root 2 over 2, which is, of course, cancelled to make minus 2 roots 2, except that's a cubed b cubed, right? So how are we going to cube root this for a b, the cube root of minus 2 root 2? Well, you just have to notice what you'd have to times by itself three times to make 2 root 2, and that's just root 2. Root 2 times root 2 is 2, times another root 2 is 2 root 2, and then just stick a minus in there, and you end up with this minus, because three negatives make a minus. And so we end up with this answer here for question number 13. 
Question 14 then. So we've got a circle center, zero radius six. Let's draw it. Seems like a natural thing to do. We've got P, Q, and R points on a circumference of the circle such that P, O, O is the origin, obviously. P to O to Q is bigger than pi over two. So this looks a bit bigger than pi over two. The area of this triangle is nine over three. Now the area of the triangle is, of course, half A, B, sine C, and, and, and A and B are both six because they're radiuses of this circle. So I can work out this angle here by doing a half times six times six times sine of this angle is nine root three. Now, um, six times six is 36, half is 18, divided by two is root three over two. And now this angle is bigger than pi over two. So the, um, uh, what's, I can't even remember what it's called. Um, the initial solution, that's not what it's called, but uh, um, a complete mind blank. What's the initial solution called when you're doing inverse trig uh, or trig? Uh, the initials, no? Okay, well, the solution that we all know is pi over three um, to this, but this is bigger than pi over two. So we go the other side of pi over two, add another pi over six onto it, and we just end up with two pi over three. So this angle here is two pi over three, which uh, in uh, baby language is 120. And that's a third of this circle, which leads us to an idea. I just tilted Q around, because obviously that doesn't make a difference. So I just tilted those around a little bit. Still keep this two over three pi. But of course, if you just stick R such that this is also two pi over three, and this is also two pi over three, you just complete a perfect circle here with three congruent triangles. And this would make an area of nine root three plus nine root three plus nine root three, because all the radiuses are the same, of course, which gives you an answer of 27 root three. Now, how do I know that's the greatest possible area? Well, uh, this is Tamura, so you don't want to waste too much time delving into a massive proof. It, it seems fairly obvious to me that the symmetrical solution is going to be the biggest one. But if you want some, at least some justification, if you just put R in the symmetrical place here that I've put it, and then just nudge it to the left, think about, instead of thinking about making this area as big as possible, think about making the sum of these three sectors, sorry, segments, as small as possible. Now, if you nudge R to the left, this segment gets smaller, but this segment here gets bigger. Now, the problem is, because this, um, uh, this chord gets smaller, it sweeps past less area and removes less area when you move this to the left than this chord gains because it's sweeping through more area because it will get longer. So therefore, any nod nudge to the left makes this area smaller than this area bigger, but it makes this one bigger by more. And so therefore, you lose total area of the triangle. So there's a quick justification that this is definitely the right answer and uh, it's definitely the biggest thing you can do. Good. Uh, so we've got two curves to draw. Uh, so we've got one that looks like that and one that looks like that, uh, eight and two respectively, or minus two. And, uh, and this is said, if you shove a bunch of rectangles in here, like here's one or here's another, what's the maximum possible rectangle area you can put into this shape? Now, I'm going to do two things here. Firstly, I'm going to move this entire picture up by two, because why not? and make this a 10 and make this a zero. And the second thing I'm gonna do is ignore this half of the picture and just double my answer at the end. Now, how am I gonna get the answer? Well, if I just call this length across X, so the width of this is X, that means that this coordinate here is now found at, well, just it, it, it's it's 10, right? Because I moved it up by two. It's 10 minus two X squared is the, is the Y coordinate, the distance up to here on the curve, which is the top of this rectangle. Now this coordinate here is just found at x squared, because remember I've moved the graph up by two, so I don't need this anymore. And so therefore the height of the rectangle is 10 minus two x squared minus x squared, because I need to get rid of this height here, which is 10 minus three x squared. And now the area of the rectangle is therefore x times 10 minus three x squared. But remember I ignored the entire left hand of the picture, so I'm gonna double that. And now I want the maximum possible area. So I'm just gonna um, find dA by dx. Now, most of you don't, or at the time, wouldn't know product rule. So let's expand this out first, and then let's do some regular differentiation. Set it to zero, because we're looking for a maximum. Solve this, square root, and now that's the answer to x. So the area itself put back in, and uh, hope this works out. Uh, we get this, uh, 10 over three here. That's 30 over three, minus 10 over three is 20 over three. Um, and then the threes make a nine. That makes a 40 root 10, and the answer is h. And we have our answer, good. Question 16, uh, this is one of those times where I'm just really thankful that I'm just really, really bad at maths because I don't really know the proper way of doing this, but I just sort of figured it out, which is nice. You, this is a quadratic. I mean, it's not really a quadratic, but it is a quadratic. 
you can use the quadratic formula on this because it doesn't factorize. Um, and you can just use the quadratic formula with x squared because this quadratic is built out of x squared. I have an entire video on this um, where I take this kind of idea to the extreme. But anyway, I can solve this by just saying x squared equals this with these coefficients. So I'll do that. I'll just do that and I'll get this. Now, the solution to this quadratic is cos theta and cos beta plus minus. So therefore, cos theta is satisfying this. So this is just cos squared theta. Now, cos squared beta comes from the fact that I would have chosen the minus instead of the plus. So maybe I should have got rid of one of these, but I, it, it doesn't really matter. It, it, I could, or I could put theta slash beta. Again, it doesn't matter. So that's that. Now, cos squared is 1 minus sine squared, so I can say that. And now let's swap this to this side and this to this side to get this. This is 14 over 14 minus 6 over 14 is 8 over 14. Except now I can just use this exact logic backwards, right? In that I've got to this part now here. If I could just find coefficients a, b, and c that give me this kind of finished quadratic formula thing, then I'd be done because this is solutions sine squared, just like these were cos squared here. So, okay, well, I need b to be minus 8, clearly, because this has to match with this. I need a to be 7 again, clearly. Now, what do I need c to be? Well, I need b squared minus 4ac to equal 8. Um, and, uh, and I know what b and a are, so that's good. I can just solve this. I get c as 2. And so, therefore, the answer is b. And, uh, and I think I'm fairly happy with that. Question 17, then. So, I made a video a couple of years ago probably one of the greatest videos of all time, where I talked extensively about triangle congruency to the point where the last five minutes of the video were a game show that I invented uh, called Is This a Unique Triangle? It's incredible. Um, I'm going to put it in the description. But essentially, here are the conditions by which a triangle, an SSA triangle, is unique or not. Here are the conditions. They're, they're just written out. You can watch the video if you want me to show me, if you want me to show you exactly how to get these conditions. The only thing that matters for this question, though, is that we want we want uh, two non-congruent triangles with this exact setup. So we want non-uniqueness. So we want this, right? So S2 is the one next to the angle. The fact that this is above doesn't matter. It's just rotated. So S1 is opposite. So that's S1. That's S2. And that's the angle, 30. So therefore, we want S2, which is this, times sine of 30, to be less than this, which is also less than just S2. So we want that. Now, sine of 30 is a half, and now I can just double everything. And now I need, uh, basically, to solve an inequality like this, I just want to make sure this bit holds, this half of it. I need to make sure that holds. And then I also need to make sure that this holds and find the intersection of those two solutions. So let's solve this bit first. Uh, just rearrange to zero. Uh, factorizes. It's uh, greater than zero, so it needs to be either side of the root. So that's going to be less than one and greater than three, I think. Now, what about this one here? Let's also solve that. Divide everything by two and rearrange, and you end up here. Factorize. And this is less than zero, so you want to be in between the roots. So we want to be in between one and four. And then when are both of these two things true? Uh, well, the only way to get both of them true is to be between three and four, and that will be our answer there. Again, watch the video from the description if you want to know where... Uh, those conditions come from. It's a great video. You should definitely watch it. It's amazing. I mean, you should have watched it before the paper, actually, before you took the paper, because it would have given you a free mark, which would have been nice. Anyway, question 18 then. So we need to draw both these polynomials. So this is a degree 5 polynomial, and it's positive. So it starts down here, ends up here, and has a double solution at 0, at 1, and a single at 2. So it looks like this, at 0, 1, and 2. Now, this here is a court, uh, sorry, a, a degree 4 polynomial, and it's upside down because P is positive. So it's down here, down here, and has roots, double roots at Q and R. Q and R are both positive, so that's over here somewhere. So it could look like this. Now, this is the case where Q is between 0 and 1, and R is between 1 and 2. So that's this case here. And how many solutions do I have? Well, or intersections. Well, I have one, two, three, four. And actually, I also have a fifth over here because this is degree five and this is degree four. And the higher degree always catches up with the lower degree. So there's actually, there will be an intersection over here. So that's one, two, three, four, five. So I have five intersections here. And even if you play around with these, like, so you can modify, the only thing you can modify now is P, right? P can be any number that's positive. 
but all P does is scale the graph to get taller and shorter. So all you can do is like make it not bounce as high here. Um, but even if you do that, you're still going to have the same number of intersections. You can never get rid of these two bits. So this is just always going to be five. Now, the next case is when Q is less than one, so still between these two, it has to be bigger than zero. And when R is less than one, so both solutions in between, so like this. Now, currently, this has this mystery solution down here, of course, like I said before. So that's one, two, three, four, five. So that has five right now. You might even be able to get it to have more if you get it, got it less stretched and made it go through here. But the problem is, you could also, if you decreased P, you could make this thing not be as, as low down, and you could put it up here instead to make it look a bit more like this. And it's probable, though I can't be bothered to prove it, that you could still miss this guy over here. And you'd only end up with one, two, and three solutions. So I think the greatest guaranteed number of solutions is probably three. Also, if it was five, it would be a tie in the end, and I'm, that's not acceptable. So I, I'm pretty confident it's three, and I couldn't find any other way of doing that, so I think I need to keep that at five. Anyway, the next one is Q between zero and one, and R bigger than two. Now this picture here has one, two, three, four, five solutions. However, um, you could draw it like this, where this peak, by increasing P, you could force this peak to miss that one, and you only end up with one, two, three solutions in total. And so this is greatest guarantee three. Uh, next Q is between 1 and 2, and R is also between 1 and 2, like this. If you make the peak nice and shallow, you're only guaranteed the solution that will eventually happen between these two. So that's 1, 2, and 3. So that's maximum 3. Well, not maximum 3, minimum 3. It guarantees 3. Um, you could have more if you made this bigger, of course, but don't care. Q between 1 and 2, and R bigger than 2 is this. Uh, you can actually only have 1, 2, 3 solutions here. So that's fine. And then Q bigger than 2, R bigger than 2 uh, is just 1, 2, 3 again. And so the one that guarantees the most is B, uh, through a whole host of pictures. No maths, just pictures. Question number 19 then. C1 is defined as this, so that's just a circle radius 5, centered with origin. Second circle, C2, has its centre anywhere between minus 2 and 2 horizontally, and minus 3 and 3 vertically. So that's actually trapped in a box that looks like this. Uh, minus 2 to 2, 3, 3. So you can put your centre anywhere in this box. Now, the question is, if this if this new circle that we need to draw is radius 4, where could we actually put the centre for it to be entirely contained within the bigger circle and thus have no intersections, right? Because if you, for example, if you put the centre of the new circle at 0 and it's radius 4, it clearly doesn't intersect the bigger circle. But if you put your centre here at 2 and draw a radius 4, then it does, right? Because it, it goes over to here and then it must go through it somewhere up here. So where can we put the center? Well, we can just put it in a little circle, radius 1, right? Because, of course, uh, the radius 4 circle, if you center it right in the origin, is always just one away from um, the big circle because it's one radius, one, its radius is one shorter. You can move it one, uh, uh, maximum one, in any distance, in any direction, and it would still just about be okay. So we need to be inside the red box, and but we want to be outside the green circle because we actually, I think, do want intersections, yeah? So we need to be in this area here. So therefore, to work that out, we'll work out the area of the box, which is not 2 times 3, as I originally said. It's 4 times 6. Uh, I was this is, It's the only mistake I made on this paper, and I was so mad at myself for it. Uh, it's 4 times 6, the area of the red rectangle. The area of the circle is just pi pi r squared, and so um, the area between the red rectangle and the green circle is 24 minus pi. And so the probability of being in that area is 24 minus pi over the total area of, prob of 24. And we'll end up with F as our answer. Question number 19, then, is another drawing question. So this is a quadratic that doesn't go down like a normal quadratic like this with roots at A and minus A, of course, because that's what solves that. Um, but because it's got a modulus here, it's going to, as soon as it gets to any negative area, it's going to bounce back up and then go back up again, right? It's all contained above this line. So that's that graph drawn. And now this one here, now this uh, a line, the line x minus 1 is just the line that goes through 1 here and minus 1 here. Um, except, again, it's modded, so that's going to bounce back up as soon as it hits this. And then it's also times by a squared. So if x is 0, um, this is just a squared. So it always intersects 
regardless of the value of a, it will always intersect at this point here, and we end up with this picture. Now, how many intersections does this have? Well, we mentioned before, this is a quadratic, this is linear, so this will catch up to this. So there'll be one up here somewhere, there'll be two, this one will always exist, three and four. So this currently has four intersections. So this is definitely possible. Now, what value of a did I use? Well, this is always one here, because if y is zero, divide by a squared, the mod doesn't matter, you need x to be one. So this is always at one. So therefore, this is the case when a is bigger than one. And it doesn't matter how much bigger you make it, it's going to look pretty much the same. So there are four intersections when a is bigger than one. Now, what about if you made a less than one, which I could draw the graph to be down here, but I'm actually just going to move the one, this one over to there, and get something that looks like this. Now it's flatter because it still has to go through this a squared, because this still has to, like, yeah. Um, and now how many solutions does this have? Well, it has one, two. It must have this one because this quadratic will curve up. It has gradient zero here whereas this has gradient one, so it will curve over the top every single time. So one, two, three, and four. So we still have four intersections. Now, what about any other cases? So a greater than one sorted, a less than one sorted. Now, okay, well, uh, this actually isn't correct. This should be a between zero and one. I'll talk about what happens less than zero at the end. But the obvious case to try next is a equals one. Now, if a equals one, then these two points coincide like this. And now we do the same thing here, where this is gradient zero here, so it goes over the top of it. We have one, two, three. And then how do we know whether this line here kind of goes inside or outside the quadratic? Well, the quadratic has gradient 2x, right? Because it's of the form x squared, differentiated is 2x. And so therefore, when x is bigger than 1, which it is over here, this gradient is 2x, which is bigger than this gradient of x, when x is bigger than 1. So therefore, this gradient is shallower, and it launches out like this which means we only have one, two, and three solutions or intersections. Okay, so we still haven't found a case for two and one, you know, two and one intersections. And this is where you need to be very, very careful to make sure you try every possible real number A, because what happens if you try A as zero? You just end up with this, right? You just end up with the X squared graph and Y equals zero, which is the X axis, and there's only one intersection. So it's possible to get one intersection, it's not possible to get two, because if A is negative, which I implied in here, but I shouldn't have said at all. I should have said bigger than equal to zero on this end. But if A is negative, because these are both squares, it, ju it just does the same thing as the positives did. Um, so it doesn't matter in any way. And the smallest thing that we can't seem to do is two. We also can't seem to do five, but that's bigger than two. So the smallest thing we can't seem to do is two. And that's the whole paper. I thought that the complaints about it were unwarranted. I thought this paper was actually quite nice. The, the last few questions were tough, but the last few questions are always tough. Um, I thought on the whole it was quite a nice paper. So, yeah, sorry about that.